All right, welcome back everybody. And today we're going to be proving Cauchy's residue theorem. So what does this theorem say? It says that if we have the contour integral over some kind of closed loop C of f of z dz, then that's exactly the same thing as two pi i times the sum of all the residues evaluated at each of the poles of f of z. So what does this look like in terms of a picture? Well, if we have some kind of contour, and let's call this contour C, and let's assume it's traversed in the positive direction, so anti-clockwise. And that's how we have a bunch of poles inside of Z. I'm going to mark these in red. So notice we have all these poles inside of this contour right here. I've just labeled them Z1, Z2, all the way up to Zn. So if we know what our poles are inside of this contour, then we can easily figure out what the contour integral over C of our function is. We just need to use this expression. And this is what we're going to be proving in this video. So how do we get started right here? What I want to do is instead of taking a whole entire loop around C right here, why not take a visit to each of these singularities and the way we're going to do that is we're going to make these cuts inside of our contour and we're going to construct kind of little paths that lead into each of these singularities and we're going to make a little loop around them so we're just going to take a visit around each of these singularities and notice that this contour right here the, this new contour that we've constructed that's no longer c because c is the path that encloses all of the contours so what we have now is a different path we'll call this new path psi and if we imagine ourselves walking along this path then we're going to go this way and inside of each of these little loops right here we're going to be traversing those loops in the negative direction so we're going to be going clockwise around them and the nice thing is about this psi right here is that everywhere inside of its domain it's actually completely analytic because notice all of these poles are in fact outside of the region enclosed by psi so what we can say by Cauchy's integral theorem is that if we take the contour integral over psi, then that's just going to give us a zero because everywhere inside of that domain, it's analytic. But notice that the integral over psi, that can actually be decomposed into each of these separate little paths right here that are connected to each other. And what we're also going to be doing is we're going to be taking the limit as each of these little paths that connect the outer loop to the inner loops, we're going to be taking the limit as they close in on each other. And since everywhere around these two paths right here is completely analytic, then in the limit as these two paths close into each other, their net result is going to be zero because well, one path will just be traversed in the opposite direction to the other path. So they're going to cancel each other out. So if we take that limit right there, then the integral over psi is the exact same thing. And I'm going to label each of these inner loops right here as gamma 1, gamma 2, and gamma n. And I'm going to put a negative just to indicate that they're traversed in the negative direction. The contour integral over psi can be decomposed into, well, again, we're going to have the loop that runs all the way around, which is the contour integral over c. And we're also going to have the contributions of each of these smaller loops. So we're going to write that as the sum running from k equals 1 to n of the integral, contour integral, over gamma and k negative. And so remember that the contour integral of a psi is zero. So all of this stuff is still equal to zero. And we kind of want to isolate our contour integral, so the contour integral of a c. So in fact, the contour integral of a c of f of z dz, let's bring the sum onto the other side. And this is going to give us negative the sum running from k equals one to n of the contour integral of gamma k negative f of z dz but notice we can drag this negative inside of this sum and now we just have a negative integral but if we have a negative integral then that's just the integral traversed in the other direction so in fact each of these little pops gammas right here we're going to be traversing them in the positive direction, so anti-clockwise. So essentially what we have now is that we've shown that the contour integral over C traversed in the positive direction is the same as the contour integral that goes around each of these singularities right here traversed in the positive direction as well. So what can we do with this right here? Well, we're going to be evaluating the contour integral over gamma k around each of these singularities right here. And the way we're going to be doing that is by using Laurent series. So let's suppose that our f of z has some kinds of Laurent series around each of these singularities. So that can be expressed by the sum running from j equals zero to infinity of a and since each of these Laurent series are unique depending on which singularities we pick to construct this series around 
I'm going to write each of these coefficients as a sub j k. And then we have z minus z k to the jth power. So this right here, this is the analytic part because we have positive powers. Then we also have the sum running from j equals one to infinity of b sub j k z minus z k to the minus jth power. And you see right here, you want to find the contour integral around the gamma k of f of z. So if we contour integrate around the gamma k of f of z dz, then that's the same thing as evaluating the contour integral on each of these sums right here. And we can in fact interchange the sum and the integral. So we have now the sum running from j equals zero to infinity. And we can bring this coefficient out to the outside because it's independent of z. So we have a sub j k. Then we have the contour integral around the gamma k of z minus z k to the jth power dz. Then we also have plus the sum running from j equals one to infinity of b sub j k contour integral around gamma k of z minus z k to the minus jth power dz. And now what actually happens is that a lot of these terms right here are going to cancel out to zero. And in order to show that, I'm going to prove a little lemma. So what I'm going to show is that if we have the contour integral around some closed path at C of z minus zk, and this is raised to the jth power, and let's suppose C is some kind of circle that goes around z sub k. What I'm going to show that this is equal to zero except for when j is equal to negative one. So notice that the c is just a circle centered around z sub k. So that means if we want to parameterize this, we have to let z be equal to, well, we're gonna start at z sub k, then we're going to add an r times e to the i theta. That just gives us a circle that goes around z sub k of radius r. And it doesn't really matter what r is. Well, if we differentiate both sides, we're gonna get that dz is equal to i times r e to the i theta d theta. And notice that theta is going to range from zero to two pi because we want to make a complete circle. So what does this mean? It means that now this integral is equal to the integral from zero to two pi of, now if we plug this expression for z into here, notice that we have a minus zk, which will cancel out with this positive zk, leaving us with just r times e to the i theta, but raised to the jth power. And now our dz becomes i times r e to the i theta, d theta. And now we can clean things up a little bit. Notice that we have an i that can jump out of the front. And then we have r times e to the i theta that also appears over here. So in fact, now we get i times the integral from zero to two pi of r times e to the i theta to the j plus one d theta. And we can split this integrand up in even further by distributing this power into this product right here. And r to the j plus one, that's just a constant in terms of theta. So we can bring it out to the front as well. So now we have i times r to the j plus one integral from zero to two pi of e to the i theta times j plus one d theta. And now integrating this isn't too bad. We just need an anti-differentiator and plug in bounds. So now we have i times r to the j plus one. Then we have, while well, just doing some reverse chain rule right here, we're going to have one over this constant multiple of theta. So one over i times j plus one times e to the i j plus one. And then we're gonna evaluate this term from zero to two pi. And this is what it's going to give us. These i's are going to cancel out, which you can do that if you want. If you plug two pi inside of this theta, you're going to get e to the two pi i times some kind of integer. And e to the i times two pi times some kind of integer is exactly one because you're making complete revolutions around the unit circle an integer number of times. So it's always going to land you back at one. So now this is going to give you r to the j plus one over j plus one times now, plugging in two pi that we said that's going to give us one, minus, if you plug zero into here, well, that's just going to be e to the zero, but e to the zero is one. So in fact, all of this 
is going to be zero. But notice we have one small technicality right here. We assume that j is not equal to negative one because if j is equal to negative one, then we're gonna have a problem with this denominator right here. So in fact, if j is not equal to minus one, then this integral becomes a zero. And how about the case if j is equal to negative one? Well, let's just trace back our steps a little bit over to here. Suppose j was equal to negative one. Well, we're going to have negative one plus one right here, which is zero. So all of this cancels out to one. And then same thing over here. If j is equal to negative one, then we're going to have e to the zero, which is just one. So in fact, if j is equal to negative one, then we're going to have i times the integral from zero to two pi. Remember this whole integrand is one. So we're going to have a d theta and that's just equal to two pi i. So if j is equal to negative one, then we're going to have the answer of two times pi times i. So what can we conclude right here? We can conclude that this contour integral over c of z minus z k to the jth power is either equal to two pi i if j is equal to negative one or zero otherwise. And we can use this fact right here to help us evaluate these integrals inside of this Laurent series. First of all, notice that on this analytic part right here, j is always positive, which means that on this sum, there's no way for j to be negative which means that if we evaluate the contour integral around the gamma k, remember gamma k was a circle that surrounds z sub k. Since this form, well, that's basically what we have over here, this whole thing is going to give us a zero because j is not equal to negative one. And now if we have a look at the principal part of our Laurent series, notice that we also have the contour integral over gamma k of z minus z k to the negative j power. And here there is the possibility that j is equal to minus one because well, j starts at one right here, which means we're going to have minus one on the first term. So in fact, what actually happens over here, all the latter terms in, in the series go to zero, but the very first term, this integral will actually survive. It's not going to be equal to zero. So if you want, you can rewrite this second part right here as being b sub one k. So this is the case where j is equal to one of the contour integral over gamma k of the z minus z k to the minus one power dz. And then we're going to add this with the sum running from j equals two now because we've taken care of j equals one. So from two to infinity over b sub j k, contour integral over gamma k of z minus z k to the minus j dz. And notice a negative, this negative j right here, that's never going to be equal to negative one. So by what we've proven over here, all of this stuff goes to zero. So what did we show right here? We show that the contour integral of a gamma k of f of z dz, all of this stuff is going to zero, except for this part right here, b sub one k times this contour integral. So in fact, this contour integral over gamma k is equal to b sub one k times, well, this integral we know evaluates to two pi i. So we have two pi i like so. Or we can rewrite this as a two pi i times b one sub k. All right, so now that we've successfully found an expression for the contour integral over gamma k, we can just plug it directly back into what we had at the beginning right here. So this whole thing now, it's going to give us the sum running from k equals one to n of, now the contour integral over gamma k of f of z dz, we found that's equal to two pi i times b one k. So we have the sum of two pi i times b one k and what we can do now is bring this two pi i constant out to the front of the sum, leaving us with two pi i times the sum from k equals one to n of b one sub k. And this b one sub k, we actually define that as the residue. So we're going to define b sub one k to be the residue at z being equal to z k of a function f of z. And sometimes you might see this written as just the residue um, of f of z comma z k. So we have the singularity inside of the argument right there. And the reason why we call it the residue, well, remember the reason was that this b1 term was the only term that survived in that Laurent series after we did the contour integration, because all the other coefficients kind of died off because our contour integral evaluated to zero. So since we've defined this b1k as being the residue, we can finally say that this is equal to two pi i times the sum running from k equals one to n of the residue 
at z equals zk of a function f of z. And hence we've proven Cauchy's residue theorem. So I hope you guys found this video useful. As always, I hope you guys enjoyed it. And until the next video, have a wonderful day. And I'll see everyone later. Bye bye.